Hey guys, welcome back to Clockwork Dante Needles. I'm back. I'm sorry you guys had a day delay. I've been very, very busy. I'm also very, very tired. Disclaimer, I have been traveling. I think I've had about 13 hours sleep in the week. Very, very low on sleep here. Very low on energy. So I'm going to do my best to break this one down. Make sure it's interesting and we cover some fun points because it was an interesting episode. There's a lot of things I've gleaned from this episode. Before we get going, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel. Thank you guys so much. I'm so thankful for you guys because it means uh, I continue talking about anime and breaking it down and there's people who want to hear my ramblings on these videos. Thank you guys so much. It means a lot to me. There's also a Discord channel too. That just allows you to get notified whenever videos drop on the channel. One day, I hope, be something that I build into and do more with. Watch this space with Discord. I know there was a comment about me pronouncing Vanitas. Apparently not correct. Okay, fair enough. I did go into the pronunciation guide there's two different ways of saying it the lane i'm gonna pick is the same lane that is pronounced in the anime and that is vanitas if you go and look online the pronunciation vanitas and i don't like the sound of that i don't think it sounds right i don't think it has the same ring to it i'm gonna go vanitas try and lean off the heavy a i think that's what's probably causing a bit of upset i do apologize i am also very tired i'm gonna try my hardest to not slip into what i'm used to to me that just felt comfortable vanitas felt very comfortable to me but we're gonna go vanitas and try and put a u in there instead hopefully you guys can forgive me for that but i want to get going with it let's break it down it was very interesting a suggestive open could have gone really, really bad if it wasn't for quick thinking. We are back in the very cold world of Gavordan. It's also very cold outside right now and really cold out there, guys. So make sure you wrap up if you are going to go out there. We have a very big problem on our hands that Vanitus is poisoned. I feel like the first half of this episode was very gene orientated and I like that. I like her as a character. She's really warming on me. She's such a nice character. Before I actually went into this part, I did have a comment and the comment basically said, if you are a Jun fan, you will really like this arc because it's a very strong arc for her and I'm really starting to understand what that comment actually means. I like the way that we have a melody faintly playing on the wind, but this melody then picks up as the storm gets stronger and stronger. Vanitas as a whole, the anime gives me these vibes. And it's very hard to explain what vibe it gives off. It's very similar to also Pandora Hearts. It's a nostalgic vibe. We have a lot to thank Jun for. It's the quick thinking that really does save lives. I also really like her nighty. I'm not sure if this is laundry. Her frilly nighty. I really like it. I think it really suits her. We end up circling round to our open. We initially opened on it being quite suggestive with them just naked under a blanket, no context. Us coming back round with the context, the whole scene feels very, very different than when we first came in. Like the ambience that is created this week, the crackling of the fire, it's very ASMR. I could happily listen to the crackling of that fire and the faint music box that's playing on the wind. It just sets a nice scene. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in the situation they're in, but it's a really nice ambience that is created. We do get some nice backstory for Jean this week. Her parents were Rufian's students. Last part, we were told that Rufian's students were no longer around. I don't quite remember the line, so no quoting me on this one. I believe he said something, his students were gone. He might have been to blame for their death. Presumably their demise. Are they dead? Just a lot of interesting questions here. We do get a very nice look at Chloe's design. I feel like she also looks younger. So when we first see her in the flip back with how John remembers her, this is how she remembers her. And she might appear a slightly older to her as she was quite young when she met her. The design is really nice. I like the white hair. Stunning as it is, it's very striking. It really stands out. It could also symbolise the character is a little bit detached, a little bit cold, calculating as well. We are told that Chloe was hidden away from the world. Chloe could also be very lonely and that would also explain the detached nature. If you're hidden away from the world, you're not interacting with people. So your social skills start to warp a little bit. The end sequence, I think we could definitely back that up with a bit. A nice slowdown from last week's fast-paced episode. Last week left my head spinning. It was a really quick episode. Nice to see it from John's perspective because at this point, Thanatus is not looking good. He doesn't really have much of a role this episode. It's not really his episode. We see Chloe as a loving, caring sister actually coming to tears when she has to say goodbye. A base marker, so we know what the original Chloe was like before she turned into the beast. It's going to be interesting to see how that happened. I've got questions about the final sequence as well. I also have questions like, 
How tall is Rufian? Rufian is really tall, or Jean is just really, really short. I think it's more him than her. But wow, he is super tall. Why Rufian? I love his design. She does tell us that it is her duty to finish this. Unable to put an end to Chloe, despite just being a tool. She's unable to perform this duty. And this is because she obviously had really close upbringing with Chloe. It has this emotional attachment, a personal attachment to her. A nice backstory. It also shows us a little bit more information on the girl that we see at the end of last week. The one who picks up Noe. Last week, I was very much on the idea that it was a subconscious, a realm within her subconscious. It could still be. I have a little bit more doubt that it is. Because she's appearing very young, childlike, within this subconscious, it could be the way that in this subconscious world that she views herself or she wants to be seen as young. It could be magic. She is apparently a witch. Perhaps the name of Vanitas's brother, Lou. Whether it's Louis. I am extremely tired. I don't quite remember if the name has been given already. Last part, I'm 50-50. I, I feel like it wasn't given, but we do know that there's a brother. Him stopping halfway as well. Could be a Louis. We only really get this opening up due to the feverish state. It's a very bad episode for Vanitas himself. It's a rough ride. Obviously, he's got a naked woman keeping him warm. And I think at one point he says he's at his limits in many types of ways. He's only triggered to stay this name because partially fading in and out of consciousness, picking up nuggets of the story being told to him. I couldn't kill Chloe. But Vanitas seems to relate to the story. The trigger for him giving us the name or the half of the name is the idea that it wasn't hatred. She wasn't able to kill because there was no hatred there. It leads me down a bit of a rabbit hole to wonder if he believed that his brother hated him or maybe there was an action between the two may have been caused by hate. Actually now seeing the way that she's acted that it may not have actually been hatred. We will see. We're only on episode two. I'm sure answers will eventually come our direction. It is still very early days anyway. Jun and Vanitas both in a predicament that they are both on a different side. One wants to kill, one wants to save. The one leading the sequence is actually Jean. Level head this week as well. Understanding that you could both have different opinions doesn't mean you can't help someone. It also doesn't mean that you have to kill them. You don't have to jump to the, those extremes. It's also her that really forces him to rest. You've got to rehydrate. It's forceful, but it's for his own good. You know it's for his own good. We know it's to save him, to make sure that he doesn't die. It does change the dynamic between these two characters. Vanitas is going to try and play it off. It's definitely changed, mainly in her. We do see that she's absolutely overjoyed and she's even wiggling around. She can see that Vanitas is okay and he's up on his feet. She then becomes very embarrassed. I did this. I was naked. This happened. Nice to see her actually reacting and getting quite flustered over seeing him. Even though she does call herself a pervert at the end of it all. It was a really nice sequence. It allowed us to see him at his most vulnerable. A nice sequence between two characters. Up until this point, they bounce off each other. They're not quite on the same page. Even just for a few scenes. On the same page, having to work together, having to listen to one another. It's a really nice scene and I enjoyed it. Jean really does actually like Vanitas. She's not going to let that even be admitted. I think she may even see that it would make her weak and she doesn't want to give Vanitas the satisfaction of saying, yeah, I do like you. And I don't think she knows if someone falls in love with him, he is no longer interested. There is this worry that if she does actually fall in love with him, he could change the way that he acts around her. My week was made. Dante slides right back into my life. I've missed you, Dante. Every single week now, if I can just get a glimpse of Dante, I'm going to be so happy. Current hobby of watching Dante and see what he gets up to. Vampire Johan. Johan is me. Him being so excited to see Dante and he knocks him down with this big flying hug. That's me. That is how excited I am to see this character. And it's also up to Dante to actually tell us how bad the situation is, to update us that the witch now has a very powerful new book, that Noe is now captive in the castle being held by the witch. Furthering our plot, this is what's happened. We now need to move forward. Dante has a key role this week. I appreciate him. I believe in Dante's supremacy. We catch up very briefly, Astolfo. He gets a new addition to his little party as well. We have Marco. Don't know too much about him yet because not too much is given. Astolfo is pissed. He is not happy. He is angry. I would be very concerned. And for the sheer fact that 
Astolfo did poison and was able to poison Vanitas as well. It makes him a very terrifying character. I'm nervous for when he unites with either of the parties. My heart skipped an absolute beat when we see Vanitas angry that he was paying for information and Dante actually kept him in the dark. He didn't give him all the details. Dante is hiding something. I'm not quite sure what he's hiding and what the motivation is. It did seem like Dante's life was on the line if he didn't give the information that Vanitas was actually needing to him. And I was really, really nervous. I don't want to see Dante at the end of a blade anymore because that makes me very, very nervous. Please, you don't have to kill Dante. Please don't kill Dante. You took Rufian from me. Dante is all I have left. Johan does say something quite interesting. He gets very angry and defends Dante that he doesn't want to let him kill any of his family. I don't know if these two are related. I can't even express how tired I am right now. I am so tired. I remember watching the episode and it's already starting to fade. That's why I have to record right now. I still have another video to do later. I'm in the right mind of pushing it, but that means I have three videos going out tomorrow. I will channel my love for Dante. I can do this. After our slightly hairy scene, which sent me into a very nervous sweat, Dante is told that he's gonna give him the information, but Vanitas immediately asks John instead. It de-escalates quite quickly. He's asking Dante for information, but then it de-escalates by him turning his attention elsewhere. I just thought that was a little bit weird, the way we de-escalated that. Both of our MCs getting a little bit intimate this week. Noe, not so lucky because he has somebody he doesn't even know on him taking his blood. It was a really awkward scene. It made me feel a little bit nervous. I don't know why. I was really worried for Noe and just the actions that she takes. We are introduced to Jean Jack. That's going to be a fun one for me. Some of these names are making me trip up more than the Japanese names do. I like Gene. Gene is nice. I really like him. Good at handicrafts. Wins many kudos in my books, the textiles and everything. Seems very protective of Chloe and the way that he gets jealous. Showing that vulnerability. Generous and good behaviour for somebody who is on the side of a witch slash beast. His considerate behaviour is very considerate considering. I'm making these things harder for myself this week, I swear. The scene at the end is going to really haunt me until next week. Nightmare fuel. The way that he walks in, hearing all the music, I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay. It might be dark and we're walking through this castle. We hear music though. Music must be good. No, 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 no. The scene itself is nightmare fuel. So creepy. All of these animatronics with these musical instrument heads. I didn't like it. She knows his name. The entire scene initially gave me charlatan vibes. Well, I was completely right there because the charlatan is sat right beside Chloe. It raises some big questions. We know that Rufian is working with or alongside the charlatan. So is Chloe. Rufian must be aware of this. So it's very odd that he's allowed John to just go. Why did he not try to stop her? What is he hoping to gain by allowing her to go and cause havoc if he's working with the charlatan? Automatons as well. They also reminded me of when we were alternate Paris. Veronica, she's rich. I don't know if she was a noble. She also had automatons inside the castle. Interesting that there could be a link here. Whether these automatons have more meaning. I feel like there could be more meaning. I think someone said that the vampires didn't like human world. or don't like the human contraptions this is now the second noble we're seeing who has automatons within their castle within their walls a lot of questions starting to raise a fantastic episode i really really enjoyed it a lot of questions i'm a bit creeped as well the entire episode had a very uneasy vibe i felt very uneasy watching noe in the hands of chloe unsure of what was gonna happen whether she was going to do something more uneasy scene to watch I'm also very worried about Vanitas. Vanitas is trying to save Chloe. How he's going to react when he sees the charlatan there. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. How is this going to be resolved? There's a lot of different characters involved on the ground. The church floating around. We've got Vanitas's group. We've got the Hellfire Witch. We've got Noe in the castle now. There's a lot of different people on the ground. And it's going to be very interesting to see who gets there, what happens, whether she can Chloe even be reasoned with. She seems very, very smart for somebody who is a curse bearer, very coherent. Can't wait to see where we go next week. Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys are taking care of yourselves, unlike me. Make sure you guys are getting a lot of sleep and make sure you are looking after yourselves. Have a good day, guys. Bye bye.